we're really just trying to foster that trust around the brand being a supportive, like therapeutic voice in your parenting journey and a place that you can really come to. I think what's different about Slumberkins amongst most of the other um, preschool properties out there in the world of kids, entertainment, toys, retail, um, is that their primary audience is really the child and wanting to get the child's attention, where our, our audience and our main efforts are on the parents and supporting the parents in their journey. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, Managing Partner of Interplay. On this podcast, I interview innovators about their strategies, industries, and decisions. This week, I chat with Kelly Oriard and Kaylee Christensen, the co-founders and co-CEOs of Slumberkins. Slumberkins is a preschool brand aimed at supporting families and helping them deal with the emotional wellness and development of their children. Through carefully crafted characters and stories, they've packaged up psychological techniques to make it really easy for parents to teach their kids about emotions. If you visit their website, you can see the types of stuff they're delivering, and they cover a whole bunch of different psychological themes from creativity to family change, mindfulness, self-esteem, and and beyond. Before Slumberkins, Kelly was a school therapist, and Kaylee was a teacher, so they have the kind of background that lends itself to this sort of company. We got into their whole story, and it really begins for Kelly and Kaylee when they had just become moms at the same time. And during their maternity leave, they came up with an idea for Slumberkins. They're unexpecting entrepreneurs who have found a great deal of success. Interplay is an investor in the company. We're really excited to be part of their journey. It was a blast hearing their story. I think it will resonate with a lot of folks. They also share what they've learned as entrepreneurs. They have a lot of big ideas and a long journey ahead. It's very exciting to watch. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Thunder. Thunder is a platform that is democratizing access to capital. The company believes fundraising should be about who you are and what you've built, not just about who you know. Founders can create a free account and add their company information and then match with relevant investors. Investors can create free profiles and provide their investment criteria, ensuring that they only receive relevant deal flow. By utilizing a double opt-in matching protocol, Thunder avoids the spam, only connecting investors and entrepreneurs that should be introduced. Visit thunder.vc to create your free account while the company is in beta. Welcome, Slumberkins team. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, We're so excited. Great. Cool. Uh, would you mind give, uh, taking turns, giving me a background uh, on each of you? How you kind of ended up doing this? I could either do go one at a time or if they intertwine. I'm sure you've done this before. Sure. They tend to intertwine. <laughs> they t- we tend to finish each other's sentences. So I'll go okay. first. Um, my name is Kaylee Christensen, co-founder, co-CEO of Slumberkins, and um, mom of three and former special education teacher behind the brand. And I am Kelly Oriard, co-founder, co-CEO, mom of two little boys, and the um, marriage and family therapist, school counselor um, behind the brand. A unique background for tech entrepreneurs. Let's talk about that. So uh, do you mind starting off by giving us a quick overview of Slumberkins, please? Sure. Slumberkins is a preschool brand aiming to support families in the emotional wellness development of their children through unique characters and storylines brought to life through our books, our products, and soon-to-be streaming series. Very interesting. Why did you guys create this product? Because this is not your typical tech company in many ways, which I love about it. Um, how did you land on this? Where did this come from? Well, um, this is Kelly. The, we, Kaylee and I have been best friends since we were 14. We met in high school. Uh, and just since becoming best friends, kind of did life on parallel tracks. Um, we were both athletes uh, in high school and in college. And just had a really long lasting friendship um, that was, you know, kind of parallel lives. We both played division one sports um, after school, both played uh, professional sports for a while in Europe. Um, and when we both came back around the same time to the U S um, started our respective careers in education and um, therapy. And 
uh, it just so happened that our passion was both working at schools where uh, emotional wellness was a really big part of what we were addressing and working with kids and families on. So um, Kaylee was at a therapeutic day treatment school. I was at a pre-K through eighth grade school, um, but working with the youngest kids and families um, as a as a family therapist. Um, and we serendipitously, again, doing parallel life had um, ended up on a maternity leave at the same time. Our sons were born just two months apart. Um, wow. So when um, Kaylee had already had a son, so she kind of knew what she was doing and I did not. I was sort of like in for the shock of my life after having my son who was colicky. So uh, I was like constantly calling Kaylee and saying, don't leave me alone. <laughs> Come over. How do you know that he's tired? Why won't he stop crying? I don't know what I'm doing. And so Kaylee and I just spent a ton of time together um, through our maternity leave. And um, because it was an unpaid maternity leave, we sort of had this idea of what if we could make something um, that brings together our passion from the schools, our inspiration from our new babies around you know, doing something different in the world. And I think we saw that the schools um, were having a crisis around emotional health and wellness. And we wanted to give parents um, and ourselves <laughs> tools to do to do better and to, to prepare their kids for what was coming um, down the line. So it was really through that that we, you know, created the first characters, wrote the first stories and um, just jumpstarted things from there. What's so interesting about that story is I think it's a common step when people go through a major life change for the would-be entrepreneurs out there to grab kind of an easy solution and try to market it. Right? There's a lot of uh, new parents who are trying to create lists of what products you need to buy or basic tutorials. The difference here is you guys have professional backgrounds and took a whole different creative approach. Were you guys always the creative types? I mean, creating kind of fantasy characters is next level. <laughs> So I think the, so both of us were using social stories when working with kids. And that just was a daily practice of using story as an intervention. So I think when we were on those, you know, walks with our babies thinking about, okay, well, what if we could infuse it with a character? And really the reason that it started out as a consumer products brand first was because we didn't know how to start a business, but we did know that we could you know, at the time, borrow $200 from Kelly's mother and because we were on unpaid maternity leaves and we were so broke um, and teach ourselves to sew. And the things that we could sew were these creatures where, you know, the first editions, mm. their faces were hand stitched um, and the sewing was pretty basic. And then we we um, paired them with the storylines as a poem on cardstock and sold them at the local craft fairs in the Pacific Northwest near Portland, Oregon. And at every craft fair sold out. And so then just, it was always this momentum though of um, feeling, getting immediate feedback from people, even at the craft fair stages of this is so powerful. My kids need to know these words. And so then going down the line of actually we were going to head back to our roles as educators when the maternity leaves were getting coming to an end. And I was pitching the storylines to publishing houses and book agents. And we continuously like got turned down. Um, and so, but, but we had built so much traction already, even in the small community that we had built that we were, we were determined to, okay, we're just going to keep going and do it ourselves. So it started out completely bootstrapped. It was a mom and educator like side hustle where we still worked for up until like this 2017 school year in the schools. And this was back in 2015. So what's, what's, what's also interesting about this is, um, look, there's no guide for parenting. I'm, I'm like you, I have two kids. I have an 11 year old daughter and a six year old son. And no one teaches you anything, right? You kind of figure it out on your own. There's lots of books and tools and you're learning socially from your friends, but you guys figured out the social emotional dimension, which isn't usually the, coaching that I, you know, the topic of coaching that I've received from friends and peer groups and the other places where you learn to parent in modern life. How did you tap into that as the focus area? And I'm guessing that's why you got such a, a palpable response so quickly as you found kind of an untapped part of the learning curve. Yeah, I think, parents. you know, 
in general, the emotional world and um, defining that, getting emotional fluency, just anything in that space. Therapists know this. People who work in this field know. It's a young field, the field of the mind and the brain and how our emotions and bodies are connected. Um, and there's, it's not as easy. <laughs> it's not as easy to say one plus one equals two and teach the ABCs or say, this is exactly what you do. Um, so I think there has been a hesitancy or a inability to help guide parents around these kind of important concepts that limit us later in life. Um, and so I think through, for me, going through the process of becoming a therapist and a family therapist and having the experience of um, doing sessions and coming up with uh, creative interventions to try to support um, the family system and uh, support their children, I gave, it gave me an insight into uh, looking at this from a systemic lens, not from a lens of saying, I'm just going to give you, you have a question, I'm just going to answer it. We look at everything systemically. And so every book, every product, every tool or piece of media that you see coming out from Slumberkins is intended to create connection to either yourself or to your child. So it's, it's trying to serve a purpose in that way that I just, I guess nobody approached it that way yet. Could you give us some examples for people who are hearing this and thinking, okay, social skills, to your point, hard to teach. We've got books and stuffed animals. Like what are we, how does this bridge from physical products to those lessons learned? Yeah. Could you give some examples on how that works and the types of things you're tackling? Yeah. So in general, when you're talking about learning about social skills and feelings, None of that is ever done in a vacuum. It's always done through relationship and through connection. Um, so most of the tools that we had seen out on the market were about managing uh, and controlling your own emotions as a, as a way to try to then be in a state to connect with people. Um, and we really just took a different approach of wanting to um, use the melody and the rhyming in the song um, to use the moment of the bedtime routine or when parents are reading a story to a child where we know that they're calming down, they're snuggling in. These are these moments of connection that are happening already. How can we uh, infuse those moments with um, powerful words that hopefully speak to what helps us kind of build who we are as people? Um, so it's, it's really complex and deep, but also we tried to make it so simple that whether you know that or not, it doesn't really matter because you could read the book and you feel it because there's a connection and an intervention hidden inside of it. Um, and we use a lot of um, affirmations and interaction within the books. So when you say something, the child then repeats it back. And there's a lot of purpose and meaning built into everything that's, that's written into the books. So what it looks like, though, is that it comes packaged as a book and character. Um, and the book is really just the script that really, you know, from a therapist lens, fosters those meaningful moments of interaction and positive attachment forming routines like Kelly saying around the affirmations. But in at the end of the day, anyone can pick up a book and read it to a child. And it is the positive words that and the the part that draws the child into repeating the affirmations and creating that back and forth between parent and child is really the magic moment um, of the brand. And I would say where we will start to steer the brand even from our uh, how we're infusing technology and looking at developing an app to help facilitate the engagement within affirmations and mantras where the, the learning comes in for both parent and child. Is, can you give me an example of an affirmation, like a refrain that you think is a key one that you, people will hear on the Slumberkins product? Sure. My favorite right now, or well, my favorite always is Bigfoot. Um, his affirmation at the end of his storyline is, I am kind, I am strong, I am brave and unique. The world is better because I am here and I like me. So when a parent is asking their child to say those words line by line back to them, those are just when you hear your, you know, two-year-old up through 
15 year old say words like that, um, that start to become implanted in who they are. Um, it's just such a powerful thing. And I think, you know, all of us who, um, grew up in an age where our parents didn't have emotional fluency to like open up these conversations of, about emotions and like tapping into those deeper parts of us. Um, we all want to do better than what we were given. And it's not that our parents messed up, you know, it's just that it wasn't there. It wasn't normal to talk about emotions in that way. And I think that Slumberkins comes in in a, a unique a unique time where people are ready for needing these tools and level of support because they really just want to do right by their kids. And that's another thing in parenting, like people don't know how to enter in the emotional realm. They want to pass off the power to a therapist, you know, like Kelly's groups at school around kids whose families were going through a divorce or separation, her line would be out the door for these family support groups. But what she knew as a therapist and what she infused even in our Fox collection about change and transitions is that really the parent needs to be the one to speak the words to their child, but parents just don't know what to say and they don't want to mess up. They don't want to mess up their children. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Hard. So I think in a very um, deep understanding why Kelly was able to simply infuse these really powerful therapeutic interventions into the storylines. Now you guys are professionally trained in these skills. Uh, is there research around or certain theories that you guys are deploying that um, other professionals would know or people listening can kind of get their head around and why they work? Yes, definitely. Um, we have a whole, you know, therapeutic Bible and professional disclosure statement that goes uh, deeper into all of the theories that we um, ascribe to from a brand. But some of the main ones um, are uh, systems like family systems, internal family systems, um, which kind of ascribes to the idea that, um, you know, we're all made up of so many different parts. and um, that there's different, those different parts of us uh, are showing up to be helpful to us to navigate the world in the best way that we can. But there is a centered, balanced, like leader or, um, you know, wise self, true self, like inside each one and every one of us. And when we're connected to that, um, we are living in, in our most authentic and best way. And so finding the place to take care of those parts of us, be grateful about how they're showing up for us, even when it feels like those parts are not wanted or, you know, trapping you, right? Like being curious about them and understanding it is a really um, important thing. Um, and then I would say, uh, you know, interpersonal neurobiology, you know, really taking the idea of the mind is, um, is not just in the brain, that it's a full body. Um, thing and that it actually exists between people, right? Like the way that we interact with each other changes our brain um, and that there's always room for growth and um, connection and uh, repair and different things. Um, so those are a couple of the, the main theories that we really love, but we use um, interventions and different thinking from many different types of backgrounds um you know like i said before managing emotions right like a progressive muscle relaxation routine is is loaded into our um sloth collection to help kids fall asleep at night that's a really typical cognitive behavioral therapy approach to really connect mind body get tuned into your body relax your muscles kind of train your body to calm down um, before bedtime so we just kind of packaged it up in a new way with a character so that it makes it easy for a parent to implement with their kids. What's so fascinating is a lot of what you just described is the language or the concepts that I heard in parallel from my personal executive coach. Oh yeah. So these, the, these things that you're applying at the, ch for children through uh, your books and, and your, and your stuffed animals um, are the same things that we as adults need help with. Yeah, that's, and that's what's so cool about this work. And I think, for me, what, what really inspired the approach that we took from Slumberkins, you know, I was a therapist before I became a mom. So I had a therapist part of me that was very strong and thought, oh, I'm going to know exactly what to do when I'm a mom because I know and I'm helping families now. 
And then I had a kid (laughs) and all of that went out the window um, because it's the great equalizer. We are, you can know things in your mind, but your emotional world can be at a different level because you have different healing work to do. And I still wanted to show up for my kids and do the right things because I knew logically what they were. Um, But, you know, I couldn't handle the crying all the time and I was getting triggered and then I wasn't showing up as my best self anymore. And I felt trapped by that. So, you know, as much as Slumberkins is for kids, it's also this gentle reminder for the parent to, you know, tune into these tools also and lead Mm -hmm. by interacting and by doing these practices. Um, Because it's always a parallel journey with your kids. And they're just showing you your parts that you're going to need to work on yourself. And at the same time, you can help them just be in such a better place than you were, right? To to figure out what the next things are that they're going to need to work on. Because there's there's no world where a child gets through (laughs) their family and doesn't have issues of some sort. Like that, we should just squash that idea. Like that doesn't happen. Everybody has issues. Everybody has pain. Everybody has. So it's just the process of how do you come back to this grounded place where you're coming back to healing? Do, I, I know the answer here, but for folks listening, uh, do parents need any sort of training or preparation to use these techniques in the way you deliver them? No, I think that's the beauty of Slumberkins. It's plug and play, like supportive, really easy to use. Anyone can do it. Um, You know, even people that potentially would never know how to like tap into their own emotional growth and learning can still pick up a book or read it and to read it to their child and still have those really meaningful moments um, with their kids. So Kelly beautifully disguised very, very, um, deep therapeutic interventions as fun, engaging storylines. And it's been actually really cool to see um, her infuse the same kind of thinking and thought around um, how to translate it into children's media, how we're going to do it within an app experience um, to help engage that, the, that like affirmation practice and learning um, as well as in it, as well as how the brand might show up in the music landscape. Um, both for parents and kids. Now, you guys to date have been going directly to consumer. Is there any plan uh, to try to bring this curriculum to schools? I know you have grand ambitions for where this rolls out. Yes. So actually, we do have um, a curriculum that we have built that's state standard aligned around uh, social emotional learning standards. And we've seen incredible traction um, within the community that is already brand aware of Slumberkins that then we launched the curriculum as a soft launch while we're still building some of the unit plans behind the scenes. Um, And it's just incredible to hear the feedback and hear how much the students gravitate towards it because I think that people are craving these conversations around how they're feeling and even teachers that are overwhelmed with the task of, of supporting the emotional wellness of kids, but not given curriculum to do it are also overwhelmed. And so I think we're finding um, the same results that we've had with the simplicity of the books being plug and play. Same thing with the curriculum. It's very like scripted, easy, any teacher like pre-K through second grade can implement it and see immediate response and results from their students. Okay. I want to focus a bit on your community when we're talking about go to market, uh, because when it comes to channel strategy, we've had a couple people on the show talk about using community uh, to build their businesses. You guys have done a uniquely incredible job with this. Um, Mind sharing some tactics, some strategies that have worked for you guys in building your community? We maybe give an overview of the existing community to start. Yeah. So our existing communities, um, our primary community lives in our Slumberkin Social Facebook group. We know that moms love Facebook groups and that's where we, um, they love to have conversation um, and build community even within each, o- within each other's family lives. And we ended up starting the Facebook group back when we saw um, so many conversational kind of threads happening on our Instagram Uh, comments and within our DMs as a brand that we're like, okay, we need a place to be able to have these conversations. Um, So we started the Facebook group and it's grown. I think it's around 35,000 members now. And it is truly 
the lifeblood of the brand. Um, you know, we know of eight people in the group with tattoos of Slumberkin's characters. There you go. Um, at one very cool grandma with a sleeve with a sloth like <laughs> on it. Um, but what's really cool about that community is that we actually do operate it. And we have uh, another therapist on staff that oversees the um, answers that we provide for questions coming in from the community. And there are so many questions that are very authentic and vulnerable to what all parents are facing in today's world around supporting their children's emotional wellness. And it has, it has really done something so unique and different for the brand that we're, we've built a lot of trust with that community in the way that we show up to support them and have that direct relationship with them. So can you give me some tactical things you guys do that have really made that community thrive? What was, um, a turning point even early on where you're like, oh, if we do this or we focus on this, um, it, it gives more soul, more engagement. Yeah. Kelly and I make a point to go live in the group um, quite often so that there is that two-way communication and the group feels closely connected to us as uh, our authentic mom selves. Um, we also have um, an engagement team that engages on pretty much every post that's posted in there from the brand that oftentimes isn't responding to questions around like what product is best for my child and doing like product recs. It's more pointing them even towards like free resources and even other resources. Um, So I think um, tactically though, in order to grow that group, you know, that group is kind of the bottom of the, the funnel of like the Slumberkins like customer journey. And it's been a very, um, we haven't ever like paid to increase awareness for that group. It's been an open invitation for once someone joins our email list or an SMS list or um, on organic social media channels. And oftentimes I think some of the tactics are people get really excited about the plush toy aspect of the world sometimes like, you know, the vi- we always say the vitamins are in the books and storylines, but then the plush is like the candy that people just like <laughs> love and are obsessed with, which is great. Um, but um, so sometimes we'll say, you know, there's exclusive like news or product drops like specific to the Slumber and Social Group. So join there if if you want like first dibs or whatnot, because um, as we've grown, we've oftentimes had a hard time keeping up with the demand. So I guess from like a growth tactic, that's one to give like kind of con- exclusive content and programming to the group. Have you found as you go through your, your customer journey, the funnel, what type of customer ends up opting into the community? Is it your most loyal? Are they looking for some type, you know, your most needy? Is it, what is the descriptor for the customer that opts in? I would say in that group, it's primarily parents. There are some that aren't. We we actually ended up starting an educator group specific for educator content because the the use case and the conversation is a little bit different on how you're implementing Slumberkins and why. Um, but I think oftentimes people are joining. I would say it's different pre and post COVID. Pre COVID, it was a lot of that. Um, I want the exclusive access to like the drops that I can't get my hands on uh, right. public facing. And then post COVID, yeah, post COVID, it was, oh my God, I'm so alone in parenting right now. And parents were finding community online and it was a really supportive group with tons of free resources um, being provided to them at the time because we're, we were all in survival mode, which I would say we're all still in survival <laughs> mode. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's changed a little bit. Yeah. Have you found that the customers in the community have or have a higher purchasing behavior than other customers? Yeah, right now it's five times more. Okay, so why have you guys thought uh, not sought to advertise and try to drive people into the community? What's been the thinking there? I think we organically advertise advertise it. Um, we just you know that community is so important to us that we are trying to. Uh, strategize around how do we keep it authentic to us as a brand and us as moms and how how do we scale that group I think you know and how do we differentiate what we do with that group versus 
what we're going to do with, um, you know, I think we've almost launched a loyalty program like five times, five different times. <laughs> and then we're very conscious about trying to not mess up what we've already created. And same thing for, you know, an app or a membership or what that might look like. Um, and so with that group specifically, we were really just trying to foster that trust around the brand being a supportive, like therapeutic voice in your parenting journey and a place that you can really come to. I think what's different about Slumberkins amongst most of the other um, preschool properties out there in the world of kids, entertainment, toys, retail, um, is that their primary audience is really the child and wanting to get the child's attention where our, our audience and our main efforts are on the parents and supporting the parents in their journey, which is that group. Now, you mentioned uh, COVID drove a change of behavior in the group. Did it affect other purchasing cycles for the product? Did you notice any other change of behavior just br broadly with the customers? Well, we pulled all like marketing spend at the time. Um, and we still saw a huge increase in uh, site traffic and even in sales. Um, and I think that was due to the efforts around flipping what we were producing and focusing more on providing free resources and content and doing more like read alouds on YouTube and lives in the social. Um, they, they gave us some really great earned media opportunities because post COVID everyone was trying to point parents towards resources because you're all on lockdown uh, with kids everyone at home desperate. and no school. Yeah. Um, so it really, actually we, we grew and I think we did like over two, $2 million dollars more in revenue than what we had forecasted for when COVID, like when we had reforecasted for like COVID, then we overdid, like overperformed about by $2 million in revenue. Kelly, did you wake up before you guys started this journey thinking you were ever going to be an entrepreneur? No, yeah. this is, you guys aren't <laughs> accidental on, entrepreneurs. You saw a pain point, but this wasn't the planned path. I it never crossed my mind. Um, but I think what has been really cool about this journey is that now that we are, we are entrepreneurs, I'm like, this was made for me. This is like what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm, I love it. I love the creativity and the competitiveness and the, um, you, know, you never know what you're doing day to day. It's always something new, um, on the top right now being like, woohoo. And you know, talk to me in like three hours and I'll probably be at the bottom crying about something. And, you know, that's, but that's the life you sign up for when you're an entrepreneur. And I just, I didn't know something like that existed. And I think it brings Kayla and I back to our sports days of being on a team and like winning games and losing games and fighting to get to the championship. What sport did you guys play, by the way? I wanted to hear that earlier. I played volleyball. Volleyball. And I played Kayla? basketball. Basketball. Okay. We both played. We both had Division One college um, scholarships. And then Kelly um, briefly mentioned Europe, but Kelly played pro volleyball in Europe, and she was actually training for the Olympics. Um, wow, that That's last awesome. year. Yeah. So, she, and I piggybacked on her pro career for like three months and found a team. <laughs> <laughs> found a team to pay me in cash to show up to games. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. She got the rail pass, Euro rail pass, in exchange for <laughs> showing up to games. That sounds terrific. <laughs> Good living. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, great. So I want to I want to raise a question. You know, it, one of the things that's super important to us and kind of core to our mission at Interplay is facilitating and accelerating entrepreneurship. I just am a, personally a very deep believer that entrepreneurship is what drives society forward. Yes, people think they're waking up to make money, and that's the carrot. But it's the hamster wheel that's creating new and better social products and services and experiences that improve the quality of human life. So why do you think this wasn't more on your radar before you guys stumbled into a pain point that needed solving? Why is it a surprise that here you are as entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, and loving it? What do we need to fine-tune in society where it was on the list when you were 18 and you're like, oh, maybe I'll do that? How do we get to that point? I think my sense growing up uh, as a girl and as a young woman was that business was for boys and trying to earn money is, was something that was very for the guys. 
like, and granted, I mean, I think we're just shifting around these like deeper held beliefs that aren't maybe spoken out loud. Mm-hmm. Um, but my, my mom was a psychologist and, um, my dad was a longshoreman, so I had a interesting <laughs> parent household. Uh, I didn't have any entrepreneurs or people who had done something like this in my circle. Um, you know, we even thinking back to like starting up, you know, when people are like, oh, your first round is friends and family. Kaylee and I didn't have any family members or friends that had $25,000 to give us. Like that was. $200 was from my mom. <laughs> like that, that wasn't a thing in our circle. So I feel like, um, you know, I just had never seen and or been exposed to a woman who was doing something like this. Um, it just wasn't in my circle. And I think of at school, it's, you know, and I think of see teachers and colleges. So I knew about that. So my, my path was really determined by the people that I knew that were inspiring to me within my smaller circle. And I I didn't know any entrepreneurs. So I think that's a problem. (laughs) Do you think that might be just on the thread of lack of role models, you know, entrepreneurship has been popularized in America in a different way than it had been Mm -hmm. even a couple decades ago. I mean, things like Shark Tank are out there and they're, common consumer media now. Do you think that issue is shifting or is there something else at the core that we need to be tackling, addressing, doing? No, I think it's shifting. I think it's definitely shifting. And I, um, you know, I think it comes down to, you know, the confidence too of to believe in yourself and to have the grit and ability to go after it. It does take a certain type of crazy (laughs) to do it, you know, like, uh, and if you are, if, but if, if you're aligned with what is important to you and you are investing in yourself and you are happy and excited about what you're doing and you believe in what you're doing, if that's becoming an entrepreneur and starting a business, like I just believe that those things, it will end up happening because, um, you know, it, for us, it didn't feel like work. It didn't feel hard because we loved what we were doing. We, you know, we got $200, we turned it into $700. Now people might look at that and say, well, that, what a waste of time. I went to a craft fair and made $700. Uh, Kaylee and I, we were like, oh my God, we have $700. Quick, get a bank account for, we're going to get a business bank account now, which we apparently you have to have a business plan to get a business bank account. So we had to get a personal one first. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I guess it's like the enthusiasm along the way too, of just loving what you're doing um, can make it so fun to create a business or create what you want in your life through entrepreneurship. So um, yeah. Honestly, back then, though, for us, because we didn't have the context of what was out there, oh, like yeah. ignorance was truly bliss in that like we were just one step in front of the other, like that we turned seven hundred dollars into fifteen hundred and then fifteen hundred into three thousand. And you know, just and we just were completely propelled by that momentum and reaction with people that we were interfacing with, um, and just trying to figure it out. And I think <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know if we would have been so enthusiastic if we actually knew the road ahead, you know, of like what we would face. Um, So, but it, it was, it was, we very much put on our scrappy teacher athlete hats and just like went for it. Um, And I remember a very specific moment driving in my car. I think we were probably driving the babies around to local fabric stores, which at one point in the Portland, Oregon area, we had bought, all of the fabric and all of the stores and they were out. They couldn't restock it fast enough for us to keep up with sewing slumberkins. Um, and that at one point I drove to Sears and bought out their entire aisle of plush blankets to deconstruct, to make into slumberkins. So that just tells you the level of like demand and kind of what Kelly was speaking to this kind of like tidal wave of traction that we were constantly kind of sprinting to keep up with, which was just really exciting. 
You, you guys said something in there that I think is a very important message, something that I found myself uh, preaching on to would-be entrepreneurs. A lot of people will look at the totality of the venture. They'll say, wait, this is running a marathon. And it's extraordinarily daunting. Like, how the hell am I going to run a marathon? I've never trained before. But for people who get in the fray and are experienced entrepreneurs, they know, and or ignorance through ignorance and, and the bliss of that, you step into it. It's not a marathon. It's not 26 miles. It's just 5,000 small steps. And each step unto itself is not that hard. But you got to make sure to put your foot in the right place, not twist an ankle, and keep going. And it's a journey. So I think that message is a very powerful one. I hope more people will hear it, become aware of it, look for the coaching they need to step in the right place. But stop thinking about the whole marathon. Just take the first five steps and you're in play. Yeah. And you always look back later and can like see how naive or how, you know, we just, just the other night found our audition tape for Shark Tank and we were dying laughing because thinking back to that moment, we thought that was the best tape and we spent so much time on it and uh, took it so seriously. And it, it's like a SNL reel. Like it's so bad. It's so funny. <laughs> the enthusiasm is real. Like it's just hilarious. And I just think back and think, I'm just so glad that like Kaylee and I had each other to like look at each other and be like, that's cool. Right. And you're like, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, instead of having, you know, being on our, my own or like showing it to somebody and then being like, that is embarrassing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because we were able to pump each other up and just be like, no, this is amazing. We're going to keep going, you know, um, because I think y now I look at it, I'm like, that's kind of embarrassing, but I just laugh about it because look at where it got us. You know, we, we, you have to take those risks. You have to be willing to put yourself out there, willing to look like a fool, willing to look stupid and just keep going because you're so passionate about what you're doing. Yeah. Now this experience you guys have shared together, it's, it's in no small part because you guys are really good friends. Would you advise other entrepreneurs to work with friends? And if so, what did you guys do that made it work? Are there any steps you took to make sure you preserve the relationship through this? Yeah, I would say, I don't, I don't know about like, friends <laughs> like but of encouraging people to like find a co-founder and a friendship um but i would say kelly and i are more like sisters than friends so, i mean we go back to when we were a freshman in high school so it's not like we were friends for two years and entered into this so there's this level of connection and trust and you know we've had to very clearly define what each of us own and where we give each other trust to operate within and um Defined what we both need to be a part of. And if there's something we disagree on, how we come to a conclusion and work it out. And we also have the same marriage and family therapist that we go see because <laughs> we are basically in a platonic marriage uh, as co founders and co CEOs. And um, I mean, that's we've had to do a lot of our own personal work um, along the journey. Um, and like kind of walk the walk of emotional growth <laughs> in the relationship. And, but, but it has come down to, it has not been easy. It has come down to, there's been a couple people along the way that are like, Oh, you went into this as best friends. Did you want to destroy your relationship? That right. those like little tidbits of things though, were little red flags to us of, uh Oh, what do we not know that we should know about this? And where do we get in front of it? And Kelly as a therapist is, you know, we're also lucky that Kelly is a therapist and can <laughs> um, usually see those things coming before they hit. So yeah, I don't know. Kelly has, I'm well, sure, insight too. I would just say too, right? Like the world would tell us or, you know, those questions were coming from a place of, you know, not having a growth mindset about looking in the mirror about how you might be showing up uh, within a, the context of being a leader or the context of uh, growing, right? Like, the the assumptions around I'm right, and I'm in charge, like the kind of you know, ideas or ideals set around how you succeed that maybe the world tells us, uh, we challenge those inherently. Like between Kaylee and I as co-founders, um, we think that we're trying to level the playing field for children and parents to connect. 
that means we have to show and live a real marriage, <laughs> like our platonic marriage, right? Where we share power, we have hard conversation finger at somebody else. We look at challenges as ways to understand ourselves better and to grow. And when you have that as your base point, right? Like between how you're going to operate with somebody that makes for a good relationship. That makes for a lasting relationship. That's what you would tell to a couple that was coming in for marriage counseling, right? Um, the so parallels you are real. Cultivate that with, yeah. If you can cultivate that with your co-founder and you feel like you're both aligned around those things, then just be ready. You're going to, you're still going to feel pain. You're still going to get triggered. You're going to think you're right sometimes and they're completely wrong, but hello, that's life. It's messy. And there's always a, a moment that you can learn. And uh, if you're committed to your business or you're committed to that, that friendship or that partnership, like you find out, you figure out how to make it work. I think I'm hearing humility, focus on coaching or therapy and communication. And those have been themes in a lot of the conversations I've had with entrepreneurs who have made the partnerships work. You guys are new to the entrepreneur side. We've talked about that. What's the thing that's been most striking to you? What have you learned that you were like, oh, this is how this works. Here's the trick. What's a nugget of advice you could leave behind for everyone listening? I can go first. I'm sure we'll have different answers. I think my like aha moments have come a long way in the world of fundraising. <laughs> like we bootstrapped our company for almost three years and, um, you know, we had over a million dollars in revenue, uh, before we even went out to go raise that $500,000 friends and family round. And, uh, it was just interesting like Kelly said, we didn't have friends and family that were <laughs> the network we could go to. So we were pitching to local angel investors in Portland, Oregon, and just kind of got ingrained in that scene and um, ended up, you know, having a really hard time, a really hard time, even with the traction behind us. It was almost like we didn't have the the glossary terms of fundraising to go in and really like <laughs> own or be able to articulate the traction or story yeah. that we had. Yeah. Um and I think my aha moment was when we were constantly looking for the like lead investor to come in to like set the terms. And, but we had a lot of lo smaller angel investors wanting to give us 25 to $50,000. And we we're like, okay, we'll just wait until we get this term sheet. But then we just had a moment where we're like, why don't we just drop the term sheet and start taking in these checks? And so that's what we did. We just set our own terms and, um, it was pretty unique in the space, in, especially in Portland, if people were like, oh, you actually pulled that off? And we're like, yeah, why not? We just we just set our own terms and started taking in checks. And then all of a sudden, we had done it. We would raised the $500,000. And that was that, a That huge... is a tactic people use early stage, but you got to make sure you're doing um, really friendly and reasonable terms. You have to do like the terms that would have come out of a negotiation. That's great. Yeah. Well, we didn't know what we didn't know back then. And so we just <laughs> like, yeah, sure. It's a safe note with a certain cap that we felt good about and let's go. <laughs> we actually started a passion project to help solve this problem. This lack of access to capital if you just didn't run in the right business circles. Uh, it's a company called Thunder.VC. And the goal of it is to make it so any company based on merit can find angels, VCs, with a couple of clicks. It's currently a free service. It's out there. We put out there as a passion project. Kelly, uh, you have a similar life lesson or something else you want to add? Yeah, I think for me, it kind of plays off of that. Um, and it's sort of been what we've operated uh, under. But I always say, you know, like when you look at being an entrepreneur or business in general, right? Like I didn't think I was going to get into business, but like from the audience, I thought, wow, like these people know what they're doing. Like, uh, they have MBAs and, um, you know, or so they went to business school. They did all of these things that I didn't do. Um, and then I peeked behind the curtain and I realized that the founders and entrepreneurs that are making these businesses, if they have those skills, great, but it's not a necessity. And like, pretty much nobody knows what they're doing. They're just taking the next step after the other. And nobody, no lesson that was learned before you can like inform your decision about your business better than just you making that decision. 
So and like inform your decision about your business better than just you making that decision. So it's just crazy entrepreneurs building it and figuring it lacking. But um, yeah, the core skill for being an entrepreneur is not knowledge. It's figuring out how to make decisions with a lack of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Risk tolerance. And if you can, if, yeah, if you can do that, then you can figure out how to run that marathon. Okay, I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, we've talked a lot about the, the company, but there's some bigger. There's a bigger social story at play with what you're trying to solve. You know, timing is really everything. You guys happen to start this at a moment in time where psych- psychology and the emotional needs are more socially acceptable. How has parenting changed materially over the last hundred years, decades? Can you give us a little history perspective on how things have evolved and you know where we are today? Are we good parents today or are we just better than we were 20 years ago? Or is that even the wrong assumption? Oof, that's a big question <laughs> uh, coming from the therapeutic lens. Um, You're welcome. I'll just try to stay general. Um, I think, you know, it always depends, right? Like family systems are in and of themselves complex um, and carrying the histories, trauma histories, family histories of unique individuals that make up a complex system. Um, then when you go to the level of generationally, how what were the expectations and how people showed up as families, what defined a family uh, at the different you know, stages and, and why, why was that the definition? You know, you look back to the times when, you know, farming was important and you had a lot of kids because they needed to work the farm and did parents didn't play with their kids. (laughs) It was like, get to work. You're here to work, you know? And that was, it's, it's not necessarily like those people were bad parents, right? Like that was the context of the times. And so likely kids, didn't feel terrible about that. Like there was a role, they played their role, they did what they needed to do within their context. And then that likely shifted as they moved into adulthood and they changed or thought about how they wanted to do things different. And generationally those things changed. So it's kind of, um, it gets really complex. Um, But when I think about where we're at right now, um, I think, you know, we're at a breaking point for a lot of different things in the world that, um, you know, people have, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of things that we're doing in the world that are detrimental to our health, to our wellness, um, that maybe we weren't conscious about, um, before, right? Like just the way that we're showing up in the world. And so I think people are feeling that. And then people are also feeling it and becoming aware that they have some um, ownership in trying to undo that or trying to heal that. And so, um, you know, I think that we were not different probably than the parents that came before us. We're just in a different context. I think all parents want to do well by their children. um, And uh, the world is different and the, the way that we need to have our children set up to deal with the world looks, we don't know what the world is going to look like in 20 years from now with technology and climate change, all of these different things. But we know that kids are going to need to be very resilient. They need going to need to uh, be connected to other people to make this work. And they're going to need to be able to, you know, bring forth the next forms of what what is going to take our world to the next place so i'm reading between the lines here trying to figure out which issues you're implying and i'm guessing so rather than putting words in your mouth would you mind giving some specifics around the things that you think um have evolved in the context of parenting in the last couple decades um i think that we have more uh with the rise of information and technology um that people parents roles in how they interact with children there's there's a lot more pressure around like how how we should be guiding and teaching them um and the responsibility of the adult to lead that is has really shifted um and i wouldn't say 
I would say that that take it one way or the other, you know, like, I don't, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I can see the downsides of it, of, you know, endlessly as the adult feeling like nothing I do is good enough. I'm never going to find the right answers. No matter what I do, my kids get end up screwed up and I'm a failure because of that. Now, and if you're in that mindset and you're showing up to your family, you're not doing anyone any favors, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's not how your child needs you to show up. Your child needs you to show up as your true authentic self with your presence and to love them and to keep them safe. And um, it's really coming back to the core of what what is important between parent and child. It's providing safety. It's providing love, uh, guidance when necessary. But, you know, we are resilient. We figure things out. And with just coming back to the the deeper tenets of um, parenting in that way, I think, um, you know, people are doing a good job. But it's like, I always tell parents to not, not be too hard on themselves. I think that's what's happening nowadays that's unhelpful. From my perspective, even as a teacher, 20 years ago, it was so much more about behavior management and controlling the environment and making sure that they're just good, good behavior. And now I think with the rise in awareness around even adult mental health conversations, more and more mm-hmm. attention is going towards the emotional wellness of children. And we truly believe that behavior is just actually communication about a child's internal emotional state. So if we can go deeper below the behavior and the control aspect, we can actually change the behavior or the behavior will actually stop happening if it's a perceived negative behavior it will actually go away if you get to what's underneath it so i think we see those shifts happening a lot both in parenting and education so what would you guys change i mean whether you like it or not you guys are you've become uh leaders in the space of children's mental health you can't start a company like this get the traction you've got and not have people looking to you with curiosity and desire for inspiration are there social policies you guys are advocating for, or supporting things that you think need to be changed for parents right now? I like to ask it this way. If you guys were the queens of the country, what would you change? I mean, obviously paid <laughs> maternity leave <Okay. laughs> as, as a business that was started on unpaid maternity leave. <laughs> hey, it helped you start your company. No, I know. I'm with you on that. Yeah. And longer maternity leave. I mean, I think I was lucky. I think I was at an unpaid state because I was taking the additional three months. So I was actually getting a six month leave and even that felt short. So that full year would be amazing from a policy standpoint. Um, I see a lot of social stuff also suggesting paternity leave would help create some more equilibrium in uh, the careers of women. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. Having some sort of um, time frame where uh, Kelly and her husband did this actually, where her husband did take, he's also a teacher, um, took paternity leave um, while she was back at, at yeah. school. Got it. Okay. Okay. Where do you guys see yourselves in the next 10 years? I'm sure this has been a bit of a blur. Where does all this go? Well, from the very early days of sewing at Kelly's uh, parents' house while they held our babies, uh, so we were trying to fill out that one-page business plan to submit to the <laughs> bank for a bank account. Uh, and on it was there was a statement of articulating, helping articulate vision, and uh, it said, "Finish the sentence. I'll know I've made it when." And our answer in that early day, early days, was when there's slumberkins on ice. <laughs> <laughs> because huh. I think that's very ambitious. Yeah. So I think, you know, when you say like, have you ever pictured this? It's like, yes, we could visualize the characters knowing what passion and, and heart we were infusing into their personalities and their storylines, bringing them to life truly was a dream come true and being able to see it at that level early on, I think has been very useful and even just how we have navigated building this business and the sites that we put our, our um, expectations towards or the goals that we set for ourselves. I would say also, we tried to do this with our coach recently and he asked for the, you know, 10 year vision. And I have, it's so funny because I like, I, my mind goes out to like, 
30 years from now. <laughs> Uh, and it's less about where we are and more about where are the people that we touch, you know, where are the kids that got to start with slumberkins? Who, what kind of people are they? What are they doing in the world? How are they showing up and changing the world? Um, and how have we supported them and their families in these past 30 years is what I'm super excited about because I really believe that the change that we want to see in the world and what's taking us through these next whatever is going to be the future is our, you know, connections and the kids. And um, if, if I had all those tools when I was, you know, four instead of 34, (laughs) where would I be? I don't know. So I, that's what I'm really excited to, to see. You guys are case in point that entrepreneurship is a medium for advancing society. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having us. I love their story. It's so c- cool when the companies are clearly chasing a very positive social mission. This is where I ask you to help the podcast. If you like what you're hearing and want to help spread the word, give us a thumbs up, a five star, share with your friends, whatever else your heart desires. Thank you and hope everyone's doing well.